And since today is Pentecost, uh, I've chosen an account of the Pentecost event from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what appeared to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came running in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, saying, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live here in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Words inspired by God. Life is a story. A single story, but woven together seamlessly into a single garment consisting of a multitude, perhaps an infinity, of timeless tales. Sometimes they're personal stories, sometimes they're familial stories, sometimes they're tribal stories, sometimes they're global stories, and sometimes they're cosmic stories. But they all come together seamlessly like a single garment woven by God. And so every one of us, in a sense, is someplace in that fabric, in that garment. We're connected with everything else. Every single strand of the garment is connected to every single strand in the garment. And so for you to understand your own personal story, you need to understand a little about the story of your family, which was born out of the story of your culture, which came from the story of the species, which came from the story of the cosmos, which is ultimately God's story. So ultimately, you are simply a holographic fractal in God's story. But sometimes it's important to tell yourself what that story is, or maybe even to share that story with other people, because we constantly influence each other energetically or verbally by the stories we've experienced or the stories we've told each other. And so today, as I celebrate 75 years of life and 50 years as a priest and 25 years as a member of the Companions on the Journey, I want to tell just a bunch of stories. And I'm just going to divide it up chronologically into the three sequences in which I've lived this incarnation. From 1946 to 1972, stories about living in Ireland. From 1972 to 1986, stories about living in East Africa and from 1987 to the present moment, stories about living in the United States of America. My story in this incarnation began on the 8th of October in 1946. I was born, the firstborn of my parents, the firstborn of my grandparents, and even the firstborn of my great-grandparents. And two months after I was born, my uh, uncle Noel was born. He's two months younger than me. He was born on the 7th of December, 
1946. And my grandparents desperately wanted some companion for, for Noel. So they persuaded my parents that they would temporarily take care of me and bring me to their home, which was in Cork City. So I was given up by my parents very, very early on and raised by my grandparents, whom I called Big Mammy and Big Daddy. And then very occasionally, this other young couple, very stern looking people would visit. And I was told, they're actually your parents. I didn't like them. <laughs> they were very stern, very, very harsh, and I didn't like them. And so for the first six years, Noel and I are almost like twins living together in Cork City. And the great influences on in my life at that stage were Big Mammy and Big Daddy. Now, Big Mammy was about this height. Big Daddy was a big, big guy, a great, great uh, athlete. Um, and most importantly of all, I lived with my great-grandmother, whose name I couldn't pronounce. So I just simply called her Muddy. And the name stuck. Everybody regarded her subsequently as Muddy. And Muddy, if Big Mammy was this size, Muddy was about that size. But she was about this width. But she was a total mystic. She was a Christian mystic. A woman for whom Mother Mary was more real than you are to me today. So I would hear her talking to Mary out loud throughout the day. And I presume this was normal. And I listened into these conversations, even though, unfortunately, I could only hear one side of it because I wasn't a mystic like her. And so she taught me some extraordinary things. She told me stories about the infancy of Jesus that I'd never heard, you know, in church, never heard in the seminary, I never heard until I was in my 50s. And I started reading the Gnostic Gospels. And I came across a passage that some of the infancy Gospels of Jesus that never made it into the New Testament, you know, had been translated into Gaelic in the 6th and 7th centuries. And somehow there was an oral tradition in Ireland that never got mentioned in the churches, but that people, rural people particularly, were raised on. And she, she had all these great stories about the baby Jesus yeah, and the boy Jesus and what he did. And much more importantly, she took me around with her to different churches. She went to Mass every single morning. She started you know, in St. Francis Church in Cork City, a church uh, run by the Franciscan Friars. And then when Mass was finished, we would go to another church called Saints Peter and Paul's. And particularly at Christmas time, there was a huge life-size crash in that church, life-size figures. And after the Mass was finished there, she'd go up the steps, there was about nine or ten steps up to it, and she'd puff her way up to the top of the steps, dragging me behind her, and she'd go up and she'd kneel in front of the crash, and she'd talk to Mary. And there were life-size figures. And one day particularly, this local prankster, obviously, who knew what was happening, he knew the style, he got up there ahead of us, we didn't see him, and he hid himself next to the baby Jesus in the manger, covered himself in straw. And we come up, and Muddy kneels down, and she's talking to Mary. And all of a sudden, there's this squeaky little voice that says, Why are you always asking for stuff? You come in here every day, and you're asking my mother for stuff. And my grandmother looks over at the baby Jesus, and she says, Be quiet, child. I'm talking to your mother. <laughs> and that shut him up. That's who she was. And then, one of the worst days of my life, I had just turned seven, so it's October 1953. And every Saturday morning, Noel and I would go to the movies. There were special movies for kids. Um, and it was a Tarzan movie. And I just about head out the door on a Saturday morning, and my mother comes visiting. And there's this huge altercation between my mother and my grandmother, at the end of which I was told, get your coat, you're coming home. I'm thinking, home? This is my home. And I'm looking at Big Mammy, are you going to intervene? And she was powerless. And so I'm dragged out to where I now discover I have a brother and two sisters living out in the middle of the bush, in a, literally in a field, a house in the middle of the field, which is about a mile from the nearest road, and there's a dirt track connecting us to the nearest road. It's a house without indoor plumbing or electricity. And I have my other grandparents are living there, my mother's parents. And um, I fell in love with my grandfather at that side, Daddy Jim, who was a druid. So he was everything that Muddy was not. He wasn't a great believer in Christianity, but he was a total believer in Irish mythology and in Druidry. And so he filled up my young head with these extraordinary mythological stories of the Tuatha Dé Danann and Fionn Machol and Anne Cochulainn and people near Cianor, people like that. And then we moved after a year to another house, which was uh, next to a mills, a shovel mills. My mother worked in the shovel mills there, into another little house without electricity or indoor plumbing. 
and we lived there for about another year and a half. And then finally we moved into a project on the outskirts of Cork City, it was actually in the county, called Mayfield, into a new park, 34 new houses called St. Joseph's Park, and we had plumbing and electricity. And we all moved in, it was January 1956, and I'm thinking, this is great, things can only get better from here. 1956 turned out to be one of the toughest years of my life, because in June of 1956, Muddy died of a stroke. And in December of 1956, Daddy Jim died of a stroke. So in a six month period, I'm bereft of the two greatest influences on my life to date. But life continues. I went to school. I cycled three miles to school every day to a place called the North Mon, the North Monastery, which was run by the Christian brothers. You know, and I finished my primary school education there, went on to high school there. And then for the last two years, in high school, I had this really nagging feeling that somehow I wanted to be a priest. And I was really embarrassed about it because I was a real jock, real good athlete, real good in school. And I was really embarrassed, so I didn't tell anybody about it. But every morning as I was cycling to school, I'd leave early and uh, go to Mass on the way. And on the way home every evening, I'd go into the church and do the Stations of the Cross and say the Rosary. But I kept it completely to myself. And I was in contact with a group of Irish missionaries called the Kiltegan Fathers, otherwise known as the St. Patrick's Missionary Society. And we, had, we talked to each other backwards and forwards for about 18 months. And then finally they said, the last thing you need to do is you need a medical checkup. We need to know that you're in good health and that you're a real boy. So I have no money. We didn't get pocket money. So I go to my mother and I say, could you give me 10 shillings? 10 shillings is about $4 at a time. She said, what do, you, what do you need 10 shillings for? I said, I need to see the doctor. She said, you do? What's wrong with you? I said, nothing. Why are you going to see the doctor if there's nothing wrong with you? And then I had to spill the beans. And so I obviously passed the test. And uh, at the end of 1964, on the 14th of September 1964, the Feast of the Holy Cross, I entered the seminary with 43 classmates. Now, by the end of eight years of training, that would be down to 12 because it was at the time of Vatican II and there was tremendous fallout for the church. So I entered the seminary, I'm just about to turn 18, and uh, there are eight great, very, very happy years of my life, uh, mainly. Part of it involved, you know, going to the National University of Ireland, where I did a double major in uh, pure mathematics, and uh, not quite as good as Ed Lawler, uh, Ed, Ed Hannibal. Uh, I did pure mathematics and mathematical physics, um, and then went on to study theology and philosophy, uh, and scripture in the seminary. Now, the first year into it, we were not allowed to go home. The seminary was about 130 miles from Cork City. We were not allowed to visit family during the first year. It was a novitiate. And on the uh, four, 13th of April in 1965, coming to the end of the first year, I got ca called into the rector's office. A small little guy called Jimmy Lane with a ferocious accent, a guy who was so into digging into humility that he would never actually look at you. His eyes were always down. He had these beautiful blue eyes and he had this tremulous voice and he said, your, your, your grandmother just died. I'm shocked. And I say, which grandmother, Father? Your, your, your mother's mother, she just died. And I said, and, 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 and when's the funeral? It is on Friday. And, I'm thinking, and I said, how do I get there? You're not going there. Let the dead bury their dead. And that was my first test of somebody, a trained theologian, taking the words of scripture and twisting them out of uh, all kind of recognizability. But I survived it. Came home at the end of the year to find my grandmother was gone, the woman who had kind of raised me from, you know, uh, 1953 to 1964. She was no longer, no longer there. But I persevered and I loved the, tra the seminary training, made great, great friends there. You know, continued to play hurling. I represented University College Cork, and I represented my county uh, as a hurler. You know, and then finished with a, a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics and mathematical physics. And then the great day arrived, June the fourth, 1972, a date that I had been longing for, dreaming about for 10 years, and training for for eight years. Easily the most extraordinary day and the most anticipated day of my life and the ordination ceremony is over, and we're back in the seminary, and all the families have gathered together for a final meal, and all of the other students who are still training are there, 
And at the end of it, I look around the refectory, and there's maybe 200 people in the refectory. And I suddenly realize these 11 classmates of mine were never going to sit down at the same table again together. In fact, there are some of these men I will never meet again. And it proved to be true. We have never sat down at the same table again. And some of these guys I have never met in 50 years as a priest. So there's this extraordinary nostalgia that goes with the realization of a dream. And that became important to me for many, many other reasons subsequently. That what you wish for and what you long for and what you train for when it arrives, it brings great blessings and it brings its own, you know, kind of nostalgia with it. The, you know, the realization that I've never met some of these guys in 50 years. Now, I hope they're back in Ireland. Yesterday was our official date, James Ford. I hope some of them are back there celebrating together, you know, today. So, at that stage now, I'm ready to be kind of released on Africa. So, this is the second stage of my storytelling. On the 8th of November, 1972, I arrive in Nairobi Airport. And this is what I've been waiting for and hoping for and dreaming about for over 10 years and training for, for eight years. And I've arrived, and my first mission is a little place called Njoro, working among the Kikuyu people. And I'm assigned to um, another Kiltigan father, a guy called Derry Buckley. And Derry Buckley actually was from Cork City as well. And he'd actually gone through the same high school that I'd gone through, the North Monastery. So we had the same accent. And uh, Derry's job was to train me to how to be a missionary on the ground. And also, I began uh, learning Swahili at that stage as well. And I always remember, I'm only there about six or seven weeks, and uh, Derry sends me to, on Christmas Day to one of the outstations. And he gives me, in Swahili, uh, Swahili and uh, the Kalenjin languages are very onomatopoeic. And so he gave me a motorbike to go off to an outstation. I have my mask here on my back, and I'm driving this motorcycle. In Swahili, we call it a piki piki. And in Kal Kalenjin, we call it kip tuk tukut. So they're very onomatopoeic. So I'm driving my kip tuk tukut, and I go and I say mass at an outstation. And I'm on my way back, and there's all dirt tracks with about six inches of murram. And I come around a bend in the road, and there's a woman with a big water jar walking in front of me. And so I try to move her out of the way. She screams, jumps the jar, and heads off into the bush. I crash the motorbike, I get back up, and the front wheel is at an angle of about 60 degrees to the rest of the bike. <laughs> and I can't straighten it out. And so I'm trying to drag a picky picky for about six miles with my knapsack full of my mass equipment back to the mission. So that was a baptism of fire as a missionary. After five months, I was moved. That was very typical of missionary life. You get moved without notice. So after five months, in March of 1973, I get moved to a very big but a very remote mission called El Dama Ravine. And El Dama Ravine had a hospital which was run by the Cork Miss Mercy Sisters. So again, I could understand the accent. And they also ran a girls' uh, boarding school, which was really unusual as well, educating girls in Kenya. Kenya at that stage was still in the first decade of its independence uh, from, from Britain. They'd gotten independence on the 12th of December, 1963. And so I get moved to Aldam Ravine. It's a huge, sprawling parish. One of my outstations is actually 90 miles away from the central mission. And I know I've upgraded. I have a Volkswagen Beetle uh, to get me around. And I, I stayed there for about six months. And then I was sent down to Tanzania with uh, two other Kiltigan fathers to Tabora, to a language training center. They wanted us to get really, really, really good at Swahili. And the best Swahili in the world is spoken in Tanzania. So I spent three months in Tabora with a classmate of mine, Jimmy King, who was ordained on the same day, and another guy called Jerry Roach. Jerry was the same class as Jerry Buckley. They had been ordained in 1968, four years ahead of me. An extraordinary character, Jerry Roach. And I want to jump forward a little bit. You know, Jerry Roach was subsequently murdered in the mission in Kericho during riots between, tribal riots between the Kalenjin and the Kikuyu. And Jerry had refugees in his mission that he was refusing to give up during the struggle. And one night, two people came in and literally cut his throat. But he had an extraordinary character. I was jumping ahead a little bit. Jerry was an amazing character. So we come back from uh, Tanzania in December of 1973. And of course, I'd been there for three months. I'd been in El Dama Ravine for six months. It's time to move me again. I get moved to Kip Chim Chim. And somehow I lasted in Kip Chim Chim for six whole years. And Kip Chim Chim was a very, very big compound. We had um, a primary school. We had a secondary school. We had a convent of African sisters called the Asumbi Sisters who ran a maternity hospital on the compound. And we had a hostel for physically disabled children, mainly polio 
children who lived you know, during the term and then went home during the holiday period of time. So I was there for six years. Initially, I went in there as the headmaster of Kip Chim Chim Harambe Secondary School. Now, Harambe simply means self-help. It means that the parents were completely responsible for building it, you know, paying school fees for the kids. Everything was dependent upon the local parents. And I was the headmaster of that. A year into it, I was living at that stage with another Kiltigan father called Paddy Gallagher. And he was the, the pastor, or what was called the father in charge, you know, what you would call here the pastor. He got moved to Rome to study canon law. And so now I'm in charge of the parish and I'm in charge of the school. So at that stage, I started asking for help. And a whole bunch of Irish lay volunteers came out to take over the school. Some great, great guys. Uh, Dennis Bates was one of them. Frank Conlesk was another one of them. Um, Patrick Vincent Breen was another one of them. So I actually paid a, we played a huge trick on Patrick Vincent Breen at some stage. I was doing lots of building. So I built a huge big circular urinal for the boys. It was a, it was a boarding school. And uh, we got a plaque made out. Uh, in plastic, nailed to it, it says the Patrick Vincent Breen Memorial Urinal. <laughs> it's probably still there today. <laughs> so a whole bunch of uh, Irish volunteers came in and took over the school. And then the last year I was there, there was a young Kerry priest, a guy called John Hayes. Although he was not a missionary, he wanted to have missionary experience, so he volunteered to spend three years in the mission. So he was assigned to uh, uh, Kip Chim Chim, where I was. And, uh, John was an amazing guy. At the end of three years, he volunteered for a subsequent period of three years. I was well gone by then. And then when that finished, he volunteered for another one. And then one day, he was found dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. We had a water heater in the bathroom uh, that was uh, uh, from um, propane gas, and he was found dead. So he's shipped off to, uh, to Ireland via Nairobi and Heathrow to County Cork, and they lose the casket someplace in between Nairobi and London and Cork, it goes missing. So they have to defer the funeral for several days until they locate where the uh, casket is found. So John was an extraordinary character. There was one other great story from that period of time. It was Christmas Eve, 1976. And I got a message that one of my parishioners from one of the outdoor stations, a guy called Celestine Arab Chuma, had been missing for several days and the suspicion was that he'd been drowned crossing a river and that his body might be in the morgue in Kericho town. There was a big hospital in Kericho town. So we had a carpenter on the compound, a guy appropriately named Joseph, got him to make a casket. I took a sheet off the bed, put it into the casket, put it into the back of my pickup. I had a Datsun pickup at that stage. And I take two or three guys with me and we go into town and I go up to the MOH, the uh, medical officer of health, in Kirito Hospital, asking for permission to take the body from the morgue. So he gave me permission, I got on there, and there's 15 or 16 bodies just piled on top of each other in the morgue. And so I'm trying to separate them out as gently as I can, and I'm looking for one sign, because Celestine had this huge big buckle belt that was his most prized possession, and I'm looking to see somebody wearing a belt. I take out 15 different bodies, there's no sign of Celestine out of tumor. So I go back up to the MOH and I say, he's not there. And he, Consults his records, oh, sorry, uh, he was buried three days ago. Now, there's a special pit in Kericho town uh, for um, unclaimed bodies. And what they do, literally, they take a big excavator, they dig out a big, big trench, about eight or nine feet deep. Uh, at the end of every week, they put dead unclaimed bodies on the back of a pickup, drive up to it, and push them off into the hole. And then put maybe three or four inches of dirt on top of that, until the next batch go on top of it. So I managed to run to earth the, um, no pun intended, uh, the grave digger. And he comes down and I said, where do you think you buried you know, the last group? And he looked down, and under a film of earth, I can see two bodies, one with the head up there, and the other with the head down there. Now, at this stage, the Kipsigis people are scared of being anywhere near a dead body. Nobody would come near it. So I work my way on my elbows, my hands, down into the grave. It's about seven feet deep at this stage. And I start scraping the dirt off the faces. The first guy, not he. The second guy, I find the belt. Now, getting a body from seven feet down, up top side, you know, where nobody would help. So I clamber, clamber back out, get a rope from the back of my pickup, attach it to the pickup, uh, and go my, make my way back down to the grave, and I tie it around Celestine's elbow. I go back up and very, very slowly drive my pickup, hoping that I'm not going to dislocate his shoulder and just lose him again. We managed to get him out of the grave. I roll him into the sheet, 
and then turn the casket on the side, roll them into the casket, hammer it down, and then at that stage, the guys with me agree to lift the casket and put it into the back of the pickup. We take him home to his village and bury him in his village. And I wrote that story in a magazine called Africa, which is a magazine that's uh, sent out by the Kiltegan Fathers nine times a year. It's still, it's still going every, every uh, nine issues a year. And I go home in 1978 on vacation, and my father takes me aside and he said, I read that article you wrote. I have uh, something to tell you. I've never told anybody in my life. And he said, exactly 20 years ago, when Daddy Jim died, yeah, my brother Jack, Jack was Paddy's brother, and he was a bus conductor in Cork, uh, were delegated to go up and dig out the grave. Now, Muddy had been buried there just six months before. So we got down, we found Muddy's you know, coffin, but there was no way we could put another coffin down on top of it and cover it. And Jack had to go back to work, and so I'm left on my own. I have to pull Muddy's casket out of the grave to the side, to go back in and dig down another three feet in really rocky soil and then get Muddy's casket back down into it and then put a layer of three or four you know, feet of dirt on top of that for the funeral the next day. It was almost exactly 20 years to the date of Celestine and myself. So in mid-1979, I moved again to a, a mission called uh, Kituro, working with the Atugan people. And I spent two years there, another big, big compound. Um, it was probably the mission I enjoyed the least in my time there. There were people who were totally involved in what they call locally siasa politics. And so it was like, um, they have a term in, in Kalenjin, ongayam logoi, which means literally let us eat words. And it means let us gossip, uh, particularly about you know, political stuff. So it was non-stop political gossip going on. Uh, I did not enjoy my two years in Keturah. At the end of two years, in 1980, I get moved to a brand new place, Cabernet, to start a new mission. And at this stage, I had developed a really good skill as a draftsman because of my mathematical background. So I actually had, I had um, drafted and, and, and uh, drawn and built three or four hospitals, two convents, several churches, and now I'm building a brand new mission. And we found a quarry nearby with beautiful stone different color stone, uh, reds and yellows and oranges and blues and greens. And so the mission I designed in the shape of a Celtic cross. So coming from the air is a perfect Celtic cross on the ground. So an upright, the, the top, the two sides, and then a circle. And I designed in such a way that the circular part was pointing inwards, so that when it rained during the rainy season, it was like walking behind a circular waterfall. So the water's pouring, cascading down into the middle, which was a pond where I had fish, and I also used for the, for the water supply for the, for the house. But it was literally like just walking around behind the back of a waterfall, circular waterfall. And I lived there for four years, and um, I wrote my first book there in Swahili, a book that I called Ukweli Ninini, Truth, What Does That Mean? And it was um, a catechism uh, based on a story, a story of a Christ child visiting an African village and interacting with little children who were asking him questions, all kinds of questions. And so it was in the form of a story that I'm talking about various aspects of Christianity, the story of Jesus, what the sacraments mean, what's about heaven, what's, you know, these kinds of things. And then in 1984, uh, I was moved to my final mission and the one I enjoy the most of all, uh, Kip Saruman, literally means the place of the twins. And I inherited that mission, it was a pre-existing mission, from a guy called John Gary, probably the best missionary I've ever encountered in my life. And John was leaving, he was being sent up to Sudan to start, start a whole new mission in the Sudan, in the middle of tribal warfare and a civil warfare in Sudan. He was subsequently, subsequently captured, and for three months he was frog-marked around, frog around southern Sudan with, by these guerrillas. Finally, gratefully, he escaped. So I took over that mission from John. And we had a, a convent of Irish sisters, the medical missionaries of Mary, who ran safari clinics. Every day they would go out uh, bringing medicine and supplies and looking at people in, in the villages around Kip Saruman. And uh, so I built a hospital there, a school there, you know, and I added a little bit to the, to the mission. And then uh, in the last year I was there, there was tremendous siasa politicking going on. There was a big, big famine in the area, and I was bringing in food from the World Bank. I was getting three lorry loads of food every month. I was getting bulgur wheat, soy milk, and canola oil. 
which I was distributing to the villages for food for work. Every project, every village had a project that they were in charge of, you know, and then the leader of the village would come in and say there was 15 people working you know, for so many hours and they'd take food accordingly to make sure that people weren't just being given handouts that they were developing their villages. And I found out that a local politician who was an assistant minister in the government, the equivalent of an under secretary of state here, was using government troops to take the food from his own people and he was selling it. So he and I clashed furiously at public meetings and there was a tent made in my life at one stage. And finally, the president of the country, who was from that area, he was a Tugan, a guy called Daniel Toroite Charabmoy, and I spoke Tugan. He was having a big, big conference about 30 miles away, 5,000 people present. And I dress up in my white sultan, I go down there and I'm grabbed by the, uh, by the district security council and dragged before a meeting of the district commissioner, chief of police, special branch and a whole bunch of chiefs and give him 48 hours to get out. So I contacted the bishop, an extraordinary guy called Raphael, uh, Raphael S. Ndingi Monawa and Zeki. Um, and I had been sending him reports about what was happening writing up reports from people and putting their thumbprints on it if they couldn't um, make, put their signature. So I managed to get a phone call in to him. And he contacted the provincial commissioner, the guy above the district, and he said, if this man is thrown out, I will publish all this material in the local press, or if not in the local press, in the international press. So they backed off. But I knew that every three years I'd have to renew my work permit, and I knew I'd never get back once I left. And so maybe the second Maybe the second saddest day in my life was May the 20th, 1986, leaving Kenya. And spending the next year in London, in a big, grey, wet, unfriendly city where nobody made eye, made eye contact with anybody. I stayed in London for a year and I was studying Jungian psychology. Um, and also I trained as a hypnotherapist for therapeutic reasons. And I was in Jungian analysis twice a week and having Lots and lots and lots of dreams. I was recording my dreams every night, eight or nine dreams, and spending three or four hours analyzing them, drawing them, making glossaries of terms, and very, very strongly coming through again and again was a message. And so on the 8th of October, my birthday, in 1986, I wrote a letter to my superiors in Ireland, the Kiltegan Fathers. And I said, for the first 40 years of my life, I've been a good boy. Kept all the rules. I did what my grandparents told me. Then I did what my other grandparents told me. I did what my parents told me. I did what the seminary, seminary, seminary authorities told me. And I did what the bishop, local bishop told me. I'm not going to do that anymore. For the rest of my life, I'm going, to do, I'm going to make all the important decisions about my life, where I want to live, and what I want to do. So I'm declaring my independence at this stage. So I set about, I was reading a lot of Jungian psychology. And I came across a guy called John Sanford, who was an Episcopalian priest and a Jungian analyst and he'd written some brilliant books on dreams. So I desperately wanted to wed the three great loves of my life, which were science, psychology, and spirituality. So I wrote to John Sanford and I said, I'd like to pursue this. Is there some school where I can do that? And they sent me information about what was then called, you know, California Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which was based in Menlo Park. So I applied uh, there and I was accepted. So I set about getting a student visa, but, um, and I had to borrow money from my family. I was told in order to be admitted to the United States of America, you would have to be support yourself for a year. You need to show that you have $12,831 in a bank account. So I borrowed money from my family and sent them a, a record of it. And so on the 23rd of June, 1987, I went up to Heathrow Airport. I'd been told by ITP that I needed uh, eight more credits in psychology before I'd qualify for the PhD program and that I could get that in a place called De Anza College in Cupertino. And so on the 23rd of June, 1987, I go up to the um, Pan Am desk in Heathrow Airport and I say, is there a plane going to San Francisco today? There is. Any seats on it? There are. Could I buy one? You could. So I bought a ticket for San Francisco. And I landed on, on the 23rd of June, 1987 at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon and I took a bus to Cupertino. And I asked the conductor, can you please let me know when we get to Cupertino? It was going further on. And I was kind of the last person on the bus, finally, was passengers were getting off, and I noticed this place called Menlo Park as I'm going through, came through Menlo Park. I think, wow, interesting. Because Menlo is a very famous Irish village in County Galway. Yeah, so I recognized it, very interesting, Menlo. We keep going and going and going, and finally the conductor, sorry buddy, he says, 
I forgot to tell you when we reached Cupertino. We're now in Saratoga. Um, sorry, you're going to have to get off. So we get off the bus, we have a huge big suitcase, which has been over and back to Africa several times, bulging at the seams with a rope tied around it, literally a rope tied around it to make sure it didn't bust. And I'm schlepping this from Saratoga back to Cupertino. And I knock on the door, <laughs> St. Joseph Cupertino, say, I'm a priest, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> These are all your vestments and stuff? <laughs> I'm going to be in Danza College for two months. Any chance, you know, I could work here? You know, and say mass and do confessions and baptism, whatever you want me to do. You know, just give me board and keep. And for whatever reason, they took me in. And I stayed there for two months, and they made contact with Palo Alto. I finished down there at the end of September, and they said, there's a parish in Palo Alto, and they're amalgamating five churches. There were five parishes. They were kind of uh, amalgamating down to one church. There was St. Albert's, St. Aloysius, Holy Rosary, St. Anne's, and um, St. Thomas Aquinas. They were amalgamating down, so they may be looking for a priest. So I give them a ring and see if they're looking for a guy. So they ring, and yeah, yeah we could use you. So I come up in September 1987, and uh, Marge is downstairs working. The first person I met was Margie Galdez and Manny. So when he came out to say the first mass, <laughs> Manny takes me, he said, by God, we're really scraping the, bar the bottom of the barrel now. <laughs> a hippie who doesn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent eight years working there when I was, work I was also doing my studies in at ATP. And um, I was kind of doing circuit rider. You know, I, I would say masses in St. Albert's, and then on a Sunday, maybe two or three masses, maybe one in St. Anne's, one in one of the other churches. You know, I said, so I did that for about eight years. And finally, they moved me from St. Albert's to St. Aloysius, and I was there for two or three years. And then they sold it to the uh, Ananda community. You know, and then they moved me over to St. Anne's, and I lived in St. Anne's. And then in 1995, I'd finished my uh, degree at, in um, ITP and was now a licensed clinical psychologist. And uh, I get a note stuck under my door one Saturday night. I'd been giving a lecture down in San Jose, and the note said, we're reducing your masses from 20 a month down to two a month. So I'm going from saying 20 masses every month down to two. Uh, no explanation given. OK. So within a few weeks, people are noticing, how come you're not saying mass anymore? I said, well, here's the letter. So there was a big petition went to the bishop. You know, and I was called down to the bishop in San Jose, a very, very good meeting. And he said, you know, I don't want to be losing somebody of your pastoral ability to the diocese. Let me see what we can do. I come back home, and a week later, there's a letter in the post from the bishop saying, I want you out of my diocese by September. That was my second understanding of the hypocrisy and the kind of politicking that goes on inside the Catholic Church. So at this stage, now I'm looking for an apartment, and I found a place in Menlo Park. Now, I'm not allowed to say Mass anymore at this day, so <clears throat> this is when we start the Thomas Merton Centre. And for about a year or two beforehand, the headmaster over at Sacred Heart High School, a guy called Rich Dioli, had been asking me, wouldn't I like to be a chaplain for the school kids in Sacred Heart School? And I deferred it. At the, I, so at this stage, I went up to him and said, Rich, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll work as a chaplain one day a week if you give me permission to use the school auditorium for Masses on Sundays. And he agreed to it. And on the very first Sunday, there were 500 people from the parish over in Sacred Heart at Mass. And of course, the Archdiocese of uh, San Francisco didn't like that one. So within eight months, we get shut down. We're not allowed to say Mass at Sacred Heart anymore. So now we come back to Palo Alto, and we're saying Mass in the um, First Congregational Church on uh, Sundays, and in St. Mark's Episcopal Church uh, Chapel on, uh, on weekdays. And we hold that up for two years. And then at some stage, there is a disagreement within Thomas Merton Center. Some people want to go back and rejoin the parish, and others of us don't want to go back. And so on the 1st of June, 1997, we have a meeting over in St. Mark's to vote on whether or not to go back or not. And by a majority of six votes, the decision was to go back. And immediately, a bunch of us left the big church in uh, St. Mark's and went over to the chapel, and we founded COJ. So I was born on the 1st of June, uh, 1997. I wonder if there are people here today. That Margaret was there. Margie is downstairs right there. Cecile was there. Bob Allman was there. Nancy Hannibal was there. Johanna was there. And James was there. A whole bunch of people. Hey, Laurita was there. And so on the 8th of June, 1997, we set our very first Mass in this building to a packed auditorium. 
you know, and um, our founding principles were, we set up very, very carefully, uh, we do not want our spiritual director to have anything to do with the government of the group or with the finances of the group. That's totally, you know, we're within the remit of much more qualified people in the community. And we've cleaved to that ever since. The spiritual director has only been one of them, has had nothing to do with the government of COJ or the finances of COJ, which has kind of kept us healthy, I believe. We laid down a few kind of guidances. We said to people, this is not just, you know, an alternative venue to fulfill your Sunday obligation, you know, by coming for a 35 minute service on Sunday. You can do that down in St. Albert's, you know, five minutes away. We're trying to build a community. So we need you to uh, agree to three hours every Sunday morning to build community. We'll do liturgy together, we'll have lectures together, we'll have meals downstairs together, we'll form small groups. And it's going to be a Quaker model. Nobody gets to kind of steamroll anybody else. We vote and there has to be consensus before we make any major changes. And if you get an idea, don't bring it to somebody up the chain. There is nobody up the chain. You're in charge of making it happen. Either you make it happen, and Johanna's had some great ideas over the time, and she came up and I said, Johanna, make it happen. Don't expect anybody to make it happen. You're in charge of it. And that's how we've operated. You get an idea, you make it happen. If you can't do it yourself, make sure you get people who can do it. And we set, uh, I set down three rules that I followed when I was developing young communities in Kenya. Kuji Tegamea, Kuji Tumakia, and Kuji Aneza. Kuji Tegamea means self-reliance. The community has to be totally self-reliant. Kuji Tumakia means the community needs to minister to all its needs as a community and not see other people from outside to minister to us. And Kuji Aneza means self-propagation in the sense that if you're doing a good job, it'll be attractive, you know, and people will want to join the group. And there were kind of the three kind of rules that drove our behavior uh, uh, throughout our time together. Now there'll be some tough times as you realize and some great times together. On a personal level, um, on the 4th of October in 2010, I got a two-page letter in Latin from Rome telling me they no longer required my services, that I was a disgrace. I had lost my faith and I was disobedient. And I could no longer pretend I was a Catholic priest or theologian. I couldn't say mass in a Catholic church or teach in any kind of a Catholic institution, either primary school, secondary school, or college. And that the only way I could exercise my ministry was if I came across somebody who was dying and there was no other real priest to hear his confession, <laughs> I could hear his confession. I'm still, I'm still looking around. <laughs> that was a kind of a shock to the system, especially because six weeks later, my mother died, Peg died. I, I managed to spend the last 55 hours of my life with her literally sleeping beside her uh, in a little cot. And her funeral was on the 20th of November, 2010. And I'm on the altar in the church where I said my very first mass, you know, in 1972, and I'm gonna say my last mass there. In the meantime, I'm wondering, is somebody gonna run out from the sacristy and grab me and say, you, you guy, you've been dismissed. What are you doing on the altar? Get out of here. So I'm celebrating my mother's funeral mass, you know, thinking, is somebody gonna grab me and tell me, we've heard from the Pope, you're no longer a valid, you shouldn't be saying mass in the Catholic Church. We survived, in fact, six of my colleague priests could celebrate it with me on that occasion. So that was the last time I said mass in the Catholic Church. It was the first place I said mass in 1972, and the last place I said mass after 38 years as a, as a priest uh, in, in that venue as well. And then um, came back here, and um, we had some great times and some rough times as a community. But here we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. And many of you were here at that stage. So I just want to say to kind of, kind of wrap up that I've learned how to harvest uh, blessings from chaotic situations. Yeah. At age seven, being yanked out of my real home from Muddy and Daddy, and Muddy and Big Mammy and Big Daddy into a strange place with these parents uh, moving out there. If I hadn't been yanked out of it, I would have never have gotten the education I, I needed because my grandparents were not into education. None of them had ever been to high school. Most of my aunts and uncles had never been to high school and none of my family had ever been to college. However, my parents were dead set on education. So I would never have gotten the education I, I got if I had stayed with my grandparents. So there was an extraordinary blessing disguised you know, as, as a chaotic event in my life. You know, at age 10, the loss of um, Daddy Jim and Muddy, a huge, huge heartache. But at that stage, even as a 10-year-old boy, I began to realize, you know, you know, impermanence is the order of the day. I've lost the two most important people in my life. There must be some deeper meaning to life 
there must be some deeper purpose to life and began at age 10 already thinking about what am I here to do? What contributions am, am I supposed to be making? I know what Muddy contributed. I know what Danny Jim contributed. What am I supposed to be contributing? At age 40, getting more or less kicked out of Kenya, uh, realizing you know, that I'm being called to a totally different kind of ministry, a kind of ministry I would never have envisioned. I imagined my entire life would be in the bush, you know, dealing with basic needs like providing water and food and health care for people. And I find myself in the Silicon Valley with a very different kind of an audience, people who have the ability to make significant changes worldwide in, because of who they are and where they're, where they're located. So that was an extraordinary benefit. You know, with the getting kicked out of the diocese, I came to the realization I'm no longer subject to a crozier. I don't have to look over my shoulder or say, you know, here's my opinion about stuff if I really believe in it. You know, when I talked about reincarnation, for instance, at St. Albert's, I'd say Hindus believe in reincarnation and Buddhists believe in reincarnation and the Kipsigis people believe in reincarnation, so that may be of interest to you. You know, I, I could now stop saying that and say, I believe in reincarnation because I've had reincarnational experiences already. And now I'm not looking over my shoulder to see if there's a bishop with a crozier ready to whack me. And the experience in COJ has been that everybody is a priest in COJ. We have women priests, as you've seen so very, very, very often. Everybody is encouraged to develop their own personal cosmology. You don't have to accept the dogma of any institution. You make up your own through your own informed conscience. So again and again and again, what I've seen is the great blows that I've been dealt on a personal level have been the great blessings when I've learned, learned how to harvest them. Which brings me to the final phase. Even a death experience. I've had three very close encounters with death. In 1984, in Kenya, in Cabernet Mission, which was a very remote mission. I'd only see another missionary maybe once every seven, eight weeks. And uh, I got typhoid. I didn't realize it was typhoid. I thought it was malaria, which I got every year. So I'm treating myself for malaria. I'm getting uh, weaker and weaker and weaker. And I always remember one, one day lying in my bed, you know, and I'm sure I'm dying. And my, you know, my body is really, really shivering with the fever as this, and there's some weird hallucinations going on. And as clear as a bell, I hear a voice inside me saying, your body is doing what bodies are built to do, but you're not your body. And so even though my body continued to shiver, and then it said to me, and your mind is doing what minds are meant to do, but you're not your mind. And all of a sudden, even the hallucinations began to say, okay, I'm making these up somehow. And luckily, Another missionary came by, I got yanked out, brought to hospital and shipped back to Ireland uh, for recovery. That was the first one. The second one was um, about 2005. I'm living in a little cabin up in the forest, which was actually just burned to the ground uh, two years ago. And uh, we have a cabin, you know, um, a refrigerator that uses propane gas and is leaking carbon monoxide into the cabin. And I don't realize what's happening. And I kind of drag myself into the bedroom and I'm totally convinced I'm dying. So, okay, there's nobody within you know, seven or eight miles of me. My friends are living down in San Rafael, so I guess this is it. So I started singing hymns in Gaelic. And then somehow Ireland down from San Rafael rang me, and I managed to get through, and she realized I was suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. She contacted a neighbor who broke in the gate, brought me to the hospital in Healdsburg, and they said, what do you think is wrong? I said, I think it's um, a brain aneurysm. It was the 10th anniversary of my sister, Ethna, who died of a brain aneurysm. So I said, I think it's a brain aneurysm. So they're testing that. And then Ireland arrives from San Rafael with a homeopathic remedy for carbon monoxide poisoning and give, gives it to me. Meanwhile, they've sent out samples of blood. There's no laboratory in Healdsburg. They sent it to Santa Rosa, and they come back, it's carbon monoxide poisoning. Meanwhile, Ireland had treated me. I within 24 hours, I was able to leave the hospital. And the last one was in Menlo Park, in my apartment in Menlo Park. I love Indian food, and I used to keep very late hours, so I'd eat at 10 o'clock at night. And sometimes I'd have acid reflux. I'm lying in bed, I wake up with a start, and I can't breathe. I can't get breath in, and I can't get breath out. And it feels like there's a film over the track here, like a bubble. I try to breathe in, it just goes down. When I try to breathe out, it goes up, I can't break it. And there's a voice inside my head that says, you have 30 seconds of consciousness left. And I had thought about this many, many times. I had once performed a Heimlich on somebody in a restaurant, and I'd wondered, is it possible to do a Heimlich on yourself? And I figured out a system. I get out of bed, I walk into the bathroom, I grab a bath towel, bundle it up, put it on the corner of the wash basin, and I fire myself against it three times. And the third, there's a pop, and the bubble breaks. And my entire body is covered in sweat. So I go out to my office, and I write my will. 
I have no idea how long more I have. I want to make sure that whatever I have, somebody else will have it when, I, when I'm done. And I realized that, that every, even the near death experiences, they all had a message in them. They were all an invitation to kind of realize who I really am, that I'm a spirit in a space suit, that I'm a, a holographic fractal of source, that I'm kind of um, a soul on safari, that I'm a bite-sized piece of God, and not to kind of identify with this space suit. Which brings me to my final point. Today is Pentecost. And Pentecost, above all other feasts, is the feast of mission, being sent out. That's why I chose it today. You know, go out to the whole world, um, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. It'll be tongues of fire. And much more importantly, the prophecy of Joel, which was 400 years before Jesus. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I used to think that, you know, that was discrimination, that young guys have visions of the future and old men only have dreams. But in Hebrew, uh, a dream is a vision you have when you're asleep, and a vision is a dream you have when you're awake. They're identical terms. Visions and dreams are just synonyms. And so everybody has a vision and a dream. I will pour out my spirit on all humankind, your, your sons and your daughters, even the slaves among you, the servants among you, I'll pour out my spirit and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's our function today, as 25 years of a community. The question I ask myself after 50 years as a priest and us as 25 years as a community, where do we go from here? I have this vision that in two or three generations down the road, there will be a space-faring grandparent somewhere on a different planet, either in the solar system or outside the solar system, telling stories to grandchildren who've never seen planet Earth and were born elsewhere. And this grandparent, you know, who remembered planet Earth will tell them a story. And the most important question is, how will the story end as the grandparent is telling them about planet Earth and life on planet Earth? Every child needs to hear the end of the story says, and they all lived happily ever after. And that's my job. And that's your job. And that's our job, to make sure the story ends happily ever after.